Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this ELGL webinar. Each month, ELGL strives to bring you a new webinar to help you learn about new trends and topics in local government, as well as to improve the work that you do in your city. My name is Ellis Johnson, and I'm the Digital Content Coordinator for ELGL, as well as a uh, Master's in Public Administration and City and Regional Planning student at UNC Chapel Hill. It's my pleasure to moderate today's session. ELGL is a Big Tent government local government organization, and we work to connect, communicate, and educate our members on a variety of local government topics, and today is no exception in the world of artificial intelligence. Today, I'm excited to have E.L. Spader-Levy with us to talk about AI, Zen City, and how communities have used Zen City. Um, before we begin, I want to let you know that your microphones and conference phones are muted. This makes the webinar enjoyable and efficient for everyone. Feel free to share your questions uh, as we move along, and I will pose them to EL um, by looking at the chat box. After the presentation is finished, uh, you will also have an opportunity to ask questions. And we'll be live tweeting today's webinar, and you can follow along with the hashtag ELGL Tech. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to EL. Thanks. Thanks, Ellis. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is EL, and I'm the CEO of Zen City. Zen City is a startup based out of Tel Aviv, Israel, and we work with local government to help map citizen feedback on a wide scale using uh, artificial intelligence algorithms or AI algorithms. And what I want us to do today um, is very quickly go over a little bit this very hyped term called AI, discuss what it's about. I'll just get my slides working here. Um, there we go. Okay, so what's on the agenda for today? We'll start by talking about what AI actually is, what's behind this concept, how it works, why it became so popular recently, why it's important to understand what stands behind it, um, and kind of uh, give you a cheat sheet into um, the basic terms of AI. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning, two of the uh, biggest areas of AI, and explain how they work. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about applications for AI in government, uh, some examples from around the world, uh, cool things happening in local government organizations in different places. And uh, we'll also share a little bit about what challenges um, incorporating AI into our work brings uh, into local government organizations. Afterwards, uh, we'll move on to talk about one of, uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges of local government today, understanding citizen needs on a wide scale. And I'll share a little bit about the work that Zen City is doing uh, in some case studies uh, of our work uh, with cities, mostly in Israel and in the US. So as Ellis said, I know your microphones are muted, but if you have any questions, anything that you wanna jump in and, and clarify or add from your experience or your knowledge, feel free to do so. We're a small group, so we can have more of a conversation on this. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, your input um, uh, and your ideas as we go along. So let's get started. So why do we actually need to talk about this thing called AI? Um, I have a quote here by Stephen Hawking, one of the leading physicists in the world. He likes to say that AI could be the biggest event or the biggest revolution of our time, of our civilization. And I think this is kind of a big statement that we hear a lot recently, right? It's either in a very positive context saying AI is going to change the way we do things and give us a lot more opportunities and things like that or in a very negative, scary, dystopian kind of context where AI will replace our jobs and, and uh, 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 the computers will take over, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the bottom line here is that a lot of people around the world right now are talking about AI. So much venture funding is going to this area. Uh, more and more companies are heading into this area. And we can see how it starts to trickle into almost every sector's of our society, of our industry, and of our government. And because this is becoming more and more widespread, what I want to do in the next maybe 10, 15 minutes is try to, to demystify this concept. Behind this big statement called AI, what, actually, uh, uh, what, what is actually in there and how it actually works. So I want to start off with a question. What actually is AI? If anybody has uh, an idea or, or an answer you want to share, you feel free to do so in the chat. I'll be asking some questions uh, throughout the webinar. So what exactly is AI? I think the best way to describe AI as it is today is a buzzword. 
Does everybody know what a buzzword is? Basically, buzzwords mean that it's a term that's being overused in many, many ways um, and that it's being rep repeated in many ways and basically generating a lot of hype. But behind this big buzzword, um, there are some very strong and useful tools that if we understand and we can harness them, we can change the way we, uh, we uh, do our jobs and we can change the way we work and maybe make a lot of uh, aspects of our work and life easier. So apart from being a buzzword, what AI actually is. So Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary defines AI as the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. And I think this is very important and maybe this is the key message of, of the first part of our presentation. The whole idea behind AI is to give machines the ability to imitate human behavior or to do things um, uh, that we uh, generally define as things that only humans are able of doing. And that basically, if we try to um, turn that into something more tangible, basically this means that AI is the ability to teach machines to learn stuff, to gain knowledge on their own, to gain capabilities on their own, and to act based on their learning. Um, but we'll get to that a little bit uh, uh, in the next few slides. But generally speaking, the whole idea behind AI is to see how we can provide machines, computers, with the ability to imitate intelligent human behavior. Let me ask you a question. When we think about a computer, is a computer an intelligent thing or an unintelligent thing? Is, uh, I know all of you come from local government, so you've probably heard the, uh, another buzzword a lot, smart cities. And a lot of time, a lot of, oftentimes people translate smart cities into let's embed computers into different aspects of city management. Does embedding computers actually make things smart, actually make things intelligent? Is a computer an intelligent thing? I have to say that the short answer is no. Computers are not intelligent in any way, right? Basically, they're very basic machines that we tell them what to do and they do it. A computer will not do anything if it's not explicitly told by us to do it, unless it's a, maybe an Apple iPhone and when you update the, the version, it stops working if it's a, a new iPhone out there. But seriously, computers, are very simple machines. We give them orders and they act on our orders, right? You, when you wanted to join this webinar, you clicked uh, on the URL from the invitation and a window opened with uh, the link to this webinar. So the computer did what you told it to do. Nothing happened without you telling, them, uh, telling the uh, machine to do it. Nothing happened on its own. So there is no um, acting on anything without, uh, except for our specific orders. On the other hand, we as humans, I hope, consider ourselves intelligent. And what is the differentiation? Um, and this is a very philosophical discussion, of course, but if, I, I, if I'll sum it down to a very short statement, what is the differentiation between humans and computers? The differentiation is our ability to learn and act on our learning without defining every edge case, every use case. That means that when we, you know, for us as humans, we don't need to have a definition of exactly what to do and act specifically by those orders, right? We can have more general terms. For example, if I tell a computer, draw me a picture, um, it won't know what to do because it doesn't know how to interpret the command draw should uh, it open, uh, uh, you know, Microsoft Paint or should it open uh, Adobe Photoshop should it do this or that? It's not an explicit command, but if you tell a human to draw a picture, then a human will draw a picture of some sort. Basically, our ability to learn and act on our learning allows us to do very complex tasks. For example, math problems or reading. Imagine that every time we read a book, we had to relearn all the alphabet, all of the uh, social context, um, all of the history of society, everything, 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 we'll need all that just to understand the text that we're reading. If every time we came to read a book, we had to learn all that, we'll never get around to actually reading the book. And it's the same way for machines. Um, machines need to get explicit orders to do stuff. Um, and the, re the fact that we can do 
um, all that act on our learning makes us able to do things that are a little bit more complex. Any questions so far? If so, feel free to type in the chat. You have, um, I think it's on the left side. Um, you're welcome to um, share some of your thoughts, questions, or ideas. So the fact that what makes us intelligent is the ability to act in our learning. So if we want to um, look back at machines and computers, there are some parts of work the machines do better than humans, right? Um, there are some actions that you prefer to do on your laptop and not on a pen and a, with a pen and a piece of paper. There are things that computers are better uh, than humans in, and mostly it's things that require a lot of work. Computers are faster than us in getting stuff done in many cases. For example, long uh, computations or repetitive tasks. If we want to take a spreadsheet and change all the columns that say uh, um, someone's first name to a version with the first letter capitalized, that's something that will take us a lot of time to do as humans, but a computer can do that in seconds. Uh, the same with summing up large amounts of lar large sums of numbers or, or large numbers. Um, it's much easier for a computer to count all that and, and give us a score than it is for us as humans to do it. Also, computers don't get tired. And that's very important today in the age of cloud computing when we can reproduce a machine and run stuff on, on many, many, many machines at the same time. We can actually have um, a lot of work being done in parallel without coffee breaks, without um, uh, anything like that. So that means that they can get a lot of stuff done. So imagine if we can take that amazing ability to get stuff done and use that to do more complicated things, more complicated tasks. This is the logic behind the concept of AI, and this is why it became so popular in the last few years. <coughs> With current technology, we have the ability to leverage this advantage of machines, this advantage of computers, the fact that they can work fast and do a lot of stuff in a short time, and apply that to more complex tasks tests that are based on learning and uh, uh, the ability to act on that learning. So in order to understand how that works, we need to understand how we can teach computer to learn. And that brings us into the, the core concept of AI, of artificial intelligence, which is basically called machine learning. So how does machine learning work? Um, let's talk a little bit how humans learn before we apply that to computers. So how do we learn something new, right? We start by observing the world, okay? We use a sense like hearing, seeing, touching to observe and uh, uh, recognize some pattern, right? So um, after you've tasted an apple, you'll know to recognize the taste of an apple um, if you get a blind taste test, right? After you've um, seen three examples of the color red, you'll be able to identify the color red. So you observe the world, you get some pattern, then you compare it to what you expected. Um, is this, does this fall into a category or, or does this fit into a term that I already know? Uh, or is this something that needs to create a new category? Then you analyze the differences between, um, uh, between what you experienced and what you already know. And if needed, you refine the model. You define a new category, or, okay, so you tasted something new, now there's a new taste that you can recognize, which is called paella. I'm in Madrid right now, so into Spanish food. Um, so I've tasted this new dish, and now I know uh, how to recognize a new taste of a dish called paella. Um, and that's added to my model of tastes. Now next time I'll, um, I'll taste that, I'll know, oh, that was paella. Uh, that's what it's called. So this is how we learn, right? We observe something, uh, compare it, is it something we already know? Compare, it, uh, uh, compare the differences and then put it into a category and then we know how to recognize it in the next time. Computers can actually, with the uh, 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 technology available today, with the computation uh, um, resources available today, computers can actually learn in a very similar way. Imagine, for example, um, if we want to teach a computer um, 
to recognize a spam email, okay? So we can give our computer a lot of data. For example, 100,000 emails that we manually flagged as spam or not spam. So we show computer each example, like we would show a child, right? This is spam, this is not spam. This is spam, this is not spam. This is spam, this is not spam. But the interesting thing about a computer is that the way it makes connections within the data are a little bit different than the way that we make them. Well, we um, do it more intuitively, right? We, we connect the uh, uh, things that are very straightforward, things that are very recognizable, things that we can repeat and, and say why uh, uh, we recognize that this is an apple. A computer will recognize more implicit connections within the data to find similarities between data that we define as a specific category. But basically, it's the same thing. We can show the computer a lot of examples and tell them this is spam, this is not spam, this is spam, this is not spam. And then the computer will generate a model. It will say, it will create a model that says, okay, these are all the similarities that I saw in emails that are spam. These are all the similarities that I saw in emails that are not spam. Now, when a new email is being read by that same machine, it, can, it would be able to recognize whether this email is spam or not spam. Am I making sense so far? Any questions? Again, feel free to share um, on the chat, uh, and I'd love to take them as we go along. So this is basically how we teach computers to learn, in more or less the same model or the same way that we teach humans. And when we look at the types of learning that computers can do, we can compare this to traditional programming or to traditional telling computers what to do. So how, does, how do computers work traditionally? Look at the uh, diagram to, to the left. We take, uh, we get data like a new email, and then we define a set of rules, right? We said computers are not intelligent, we need to tell them exactly what to do. We define a set of rules, for example, if the email has the word uh, buy, then it's spam. If the email has the word re, 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 forward, 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 and the name of your grandmother, then probably it's spam. If, 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 we define a set of rules, and then it's very deterministic. The email goes through those rules, and if in each point it can be decided whether it's spam or not spam, then we get an output or decision. But in a learning model, we have something much more interesting. We take the data, and then from that data, we create an implicit model. So basically, the computer can recognize the patterns, recognize the connections within uh, the data points, build a model. That's what says here, create a function in the diagram to the right. And then for every new data item, it gets compared to the model, and we get a prediction, a probabilistic prediction not a deterministic one. So algorithms never have a 100% success rate when it comes to AI and machine learning. But in a very high level of, of uh, uh, probability, this will fall into this category or another. OK? Awesome. So when we talk about machine learning, basically we see three types of learning processes that we can take the machine through. The first, more, most uh, uh, basic one, is supervised learning. We'll get into that in a minute, how it works. We'll give some examples. But basically, this is the type of learning that I talked about before, where we give the computer a lot of examples. We say, this example is A, and this example is B, this example is C, and this example is D. We give it a lot of A and B and C and D examples. And then we tell them, this is uh, how A looks like, this is how B looks like, this is how C looks like, how D looks like, model is created, and we can recognize um, whether a new data item belongs to each one of these groups. So that's supervised learning, we'll get into that and the use cases in a minute. Second type of learning is unsupervised learning. So how does unsupervised learning work? Here, we don't define what are the groups, what are we looking for. We basically tell the computer, here is our data, look for connections in the data and tell me what groups or what contexts you see within that data. And we'll get into that also in a minute. 
And the third type is kind of like if someone here studied uh, some basic psychology, kind of like, um, uh, I think uh, in English his name was Pavlov, 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 the one of the dogs and the bell, if you remember. Um, it's what's called reinforcement learning. So you uh, give an example, and then the computer tries to do something, and you tell them this was good or this was not good. Your, your result is good, your result is not good. And with each one of these examples, um, the learning model gets better. But the first two, supervised and unsupervised learning, are the uh, canonial types of machine learning. And I want to talk a little bit more about them both and how they work. So let's start with supervised learning. As we said, one of the basic tasks of supervised learning is what's called categorization. Basically, to take our data and divide it into groups to predict whether something is of group A or of group B. This can be used for many different things. For example, um, to predict whether someone is uh, uh, in, in, in insurance or in credit, you can predict whether someone is in the group that will pay back their loan or in the group that will not pay back their loan. You can predict whether um, the image you're looking at is an image of a traffic violation or of not, not of a traffic violation and many, many other examples. So how does this categorization work? Basically, we define what are the features that we're looking at. For example, in this cute uh, uh, graph here with cats and dogs, the features are how smart the animal is and how large the animal is. Um, and based on these features, we uh, teach the machine to recognize or to differentiate between the groups. So what we do is we give the machine a lot of examples that have data about those features. So we give it, for example, this little cat here, and we say this is a cat, and it has an IQ, an average IQ, and it's very small in size. And we tell it this is a cat, and it has a very high IQ and relatively small in size, et cetera, et cetera. And we say the same with the dogs. So this has a very high IQ, but it's very large, and it's a dog. And we give it enough examples for it to learn to differentiate and to create those implicit connections based on these features, and then to know when a new animal comes in, whether it falls in uh, the area of the cats or the area of the dogs. And that way, you can re recognize whether any new item is a cat or a dog. The second um, use of what's called supervised learning is for prediction. Usually we do that by what's called regression. And that basically means we give a lot of examples and we show um, when we put in some feature, like for example, advertising dollars in this example, this is the amount of sales that we get. And we can put a lot of data points from there. So we have, uh, when we invest uh, $6, we get about 110 uh, sales. And we invest uh, uh, 650, we get about 116. Um, sales. And based on all of these examples, we create a trend line. And this trend line can continue on forever and give us prediction into how our future will look if we'll uh, keep operating with the same parameters. For example, how our future will look if we'll invest $7 and not $6.75. How much sales are we expecting to see from that? So here, the computer can help us predict based on past experience, based on a tagged set of examples, what will be um, the future result. So these two use cases are very similar in how they basically work. In both cases, we give the computer a set of tagged examples. Okay, so an example says this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. Um, 100 examples for A, 1,000 examples for B, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can predict what um, category or what output will have um, uh, the next feature that will come in. So this is supervised learning. And this is um, one of the most common use cases uh, or one of the most common basics of machine learning. And the second type is unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we don't know what we have in the data. We don't know what we're looking for, if you'd like. We don't know how to divide the data. We don't know if we're looking for cats or dogs. We just have a group of animals and we want to tell the machine, we assume that there are, for example, in this example, three groups. 
look at the different features of these groups and cluster them by group to tell us who belongs to each one of these three groups. And that allows us to do some interesting things because then if we have a lot of data, we can try to define what are the groups that it's comprised of? What are the um, subgroups or, or subconnections that we see in that data? And we'll see some interesting use cases of that pretty soon. So this was a, a little bit more technical. Any, if there are any questions or anything else um, that's unclear about supervised or unsupervised learning, feel free again to ask either in the comments or um, at the end, uh, we'll let you guys open your mics. Awesome. So moving on. Um, let's see. Sorry. Cool. So behind all this machine learning that we talked about, there are five core methods or five core uh, um, computations that are the basics for all these use cases um, that we mentioned and, and all the examples that we give in a minute. The first one is compression. Basically, understand from a lot of data what is the pattern, what are the uh, things that we see. The second is classification. Determine if an item is in group A or group B, or group C or group D. The third is clustering. Determine what groups the data splits into. What are the groups uh, from uh, an amount of groups that we define? Regression. Determine what would be the correct output for a future input. And reinforcement. Determine what action yields a reward. This is very important because these are basically the four types of um, actions, outputs that we can ask for um, from our machines. These are the types of things we can teach our machine to do and imitate in a way um, our human capabilities. And all of the uh, use cases that we'll show in a minute, all of these can be reduced into one of these five core methods or core tasks. So once we understand that this is what AI allows us, this is all there is to it, okay? Everything else is just uh, a little bit of, of, of smoke and mirrors or, or pyrotechnics around these um, core methods. So this is what we can get the machine to do. This is how we can help it imitate human intelligent behavior. And let's see what we can do with these core methods. So basically, we see applications in it of AI in many, many different industries. Some industries have become very, very versed in AI, for example, um, banking and insurance do a lot of fraud detection and things like that using AI today. The automotive industry, all the talk about autonomous vehicles. So all of that is based on the vehicle's ability to um, recognize its pattern, recognize whether what, uh, what the camera sees is a road or is a sidewalk or is a pedestrian or is uh, uh, um, some sort of street sign and act on, on those. And also in government, especially in local government, we see a lot of very interesting types of use cases uh, being created or, or being ready. So basically you can look at five different types of use cases um, when we talk about the use of AI in government. The first most basic one is to automate everyday tasks. Basically, if there's something that you're repeating in your work every day, to a very high probability, this could be automated with the use of AI. For example, if we um, uh, confirm forms, okay, we go over forms to confirm them and to make sure that they have all the relevant information and approve or, or disprove them, um, then that in many cases can be automated using AI. We can upload a lot of examples for correct, correctly filled forms and for uncorrectly filled forms and have the computer determine whether this uh, can be done or not. Second thing we can do is we can create predictions uh, using tools like the regression, like regression that we mentioned before. We can look at our data and predict what will be our future needs. For example, when we talk about um, fire departments, so what will be, uh, where are the areas where there are most chances that a fire will break out? Uh, in the city of New York, they took a lot of data about past fires to find the features of those fires. So uh, uh, location, age of building, uh, uh, the size of street, distance from uh, fire department, et cetera, et cetera. And then ran a regression and all of that to predict 
what are the areas that are will be prone to um, uh, fires in the upcoming future. Then we can adapt our coverage of the fire department to make sure that we give the best answer or the most immediate answer um, to that. But those predictions can also be in any uh, area where, 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 when we're looking about demands or, or financial needs. If we're talking about um, different types of services like welfare services, like uh, classrooms and school districts, um, et cetera, et cetera, all these we can look at past data and create predictions using regression into what we believe will be the future demand for those services. Third type, which I think is very interesting and we deal, deal a little bit with it. I'll give a few examples of it um, uh, a little bit further in the webinar, is recognizing emerging trends. So the, the computer's ability to create implicit connections between the data can, using tools like clustering, allow us to see um, trends or groups or, or things uh, that are happening that we weren't aware of. Maybe um, more people in a specific neighborhood are asking for a specific type of service, and that implies something to uh, the level of public works there or anything like that. So recognizing emerging trends, I think, is a very, very interesting use case. Uh, we can use AI to interact with citizens. I'm sure all of you at one point in your life already uh, chatted with a chatbot. Um, so all of these chatbots are also based on these very basic principles that we mentioned before. They um, take the, uh, the text that they're getting uh, and using uh, uh, supervised learning, they know what those texts are implying and what those texts are, are aiming at and can uh, generate a reply uh, based on those texts. And then they're even improved with reinforcement learning as we go along. And the last type, which I think is, is very interesting, but also um, very challenging is to enforce and regulate using AI. One of the most common use cases of that um, are, for example, traffic cameras. So today, uh, the more advanced generations of traffic cameras don't just you know, take a, a, a picture of a car that was speeding, but can say <coughs> if someone was driving in the carpool lane when there are no, uh, no two or more people in the carpool in the car, or recognize if someone is parking in a handicapped spot, or, or, or and all of that, again, is based on exactly the same supervised learning principles. We give the uh, uh, engine behind the, the, the computer, the algorithm, examples of cars with enough people and cars without enough people, and that algorithm can recognize and determine whether uh, the car that it sees has enough people in the carpool lane, yes or not. So, um, these are just examples of, of the areas of the, of the domains in which we can use AI. But here are some tangible examples. So I really like this slide. Um, it's from an article published in GovTech um, a little while back. And it has some actual tangible use cases of AI um, that are actually being implemented in local governments around the world. So um, whether it's um, uh, listening to social media, which is something we'll talk about a little bit uh, more because it's, uh, it relates a lot to what we're doing, um, in, whether it's uh, 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 delivering dynamic activity reports to the IT department uh, based on, on log analysis, predicting traffic congestion and car accidents based on data with um, uh, the regression that we mentioned before, uh, predicting crime based on regression, uh, using cameras to uh, recognize uh, specific events and alerting them, and many other examples. You'll get the slides later and you can um, read through these questions so far. If you have any, I remind you, you're welcome to write in the chat um, and share them with us. Uh, it doesn't take. Awesome. So moving on. So far, we talked a lot about the great, nice, happy, optimistic parts of AI and how it can, how it actually works, and how it can improve all the stuff we do. But when we're thinking about this future integration of AI into our workflow in government, there are also very important challenges that we need to be aware of. I'm, I'm sharing these not to, um, uh, you know, uh, not to make you not use AI in your work, because again, I think there's a lot of potential, but as we need to be aware of how AI works um, and, and be able to have a knowledgeable discussion about it, we also need to be aware of what are the limitations or challenges and make sure that we are aware of them when implementing um, uh, those tools into our workflow. So I think one of the most important challenges of AI is hidden biases. 
One very important fact when we're talking, for example, about supervised learning is that we're only as good as our data is. For example, if we only sample, if we, we want to build a model that uh, determines um, uh, what are the most important services in the city, like should we invest more in fixing potholes or in, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in renovating uh, public parks. If we look at that model, we need to understand that the model's output would be only as good as the data. One very uh, interesting story is uh, a lot of work being done on facial recognition algorithms. So today there are phones like new Samsung phones that you can unlock with just uh, looking at the phone because it recognizes your face and it can unlock it. But apparently there weren't enough um, people of Asian descent in the training data in that model. And what actually happens is that there are many videos online, and I'm serious, you can look for it, where just any Asian woman can uh, 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 open the phone just by looking at it because the algorithm doesn't know to differentiate one woman from another in that specific case. But that's just because the data that was used to train the model was biased with too many people uh, from a very specific uh, origin uh, and, and, the, and, and, and not enough people from uh, the diverse pool of users that the phone actually has in the beginning. So these hidden biases are very dangerous and we need to be aware of it. A second challenge is um, democracy. And I think this is very important because if we start to use these models, if we start to use these um, more implicit connections to build out our policy, we need to ask ourselves, where is the public debate? Um, today, when uh, a, gov a local government implements, for example, a trash collection policy. We collect in this area every Tuesday and Friday. The public can have a knowledgeable discussion on that and say, this is enough for us, this is not enough for us. Uh, we prefer other days in the week and have a democratic discussion on how to do it and why to do it. Um, once we start using mathematical models to determine our policy, while they might be more efficient and, and they might provide us with a lot of value, we tend to look at those as very deterministic and very, you know, uh, um, of high authority. And then there is no discussion on the reason behind what we're doing. We actually just say, you know, that's what the algorithm said. That's why you're targeted or that's why th those are the days of your trash collection. Um, and there is no public debate on whether or not we should do that. And th that, I think, is something very interesting. And in that sense, um, one very interesting initiative today is that New York City is actually implementing an open algorithm uh, uh, regulation, which means that all the algorithms that are used to power uh, different policy making in the city need to be open to the public and have debate over those algorithms, which I think is a very brave and very interesting uh, step to take. And last but not least, can't go through a discussion about AI without talking about jobs. So um, no doubt that, as we said, we can make processes more efficient with leveraging computers to do some of the work that might impact um, some existing jobs. I think the answer to this in many cases is to see how we can better use uh, the people that we have to do more advanced, more complicated things instead of do wasting some of their time on doing things that we can automate. So AI does not need to take people's jobs. It can um, help us do more um, advanced or more complicated things with our workforce. Questions so far? Awesome. Moving on. Well, let's talk a little bit about one specific problem that we are very interested to it in and in, in how we apply AI to answer. So when we think about city management, city management, first of all, is very, very hard, right? I'm sure everybody here on the line will agree as local government representatives, managing a city is very hard. And it's mostly hard because it's a constant challenge of prioritization. All the time you need to decide where to invest your next limited resources. Should it be in a, uh, building a new park? Should it be in adding another fire truck? Should it be in a campaign about recycling? Where should our um, limited funds, resources, time go into? And when we think about how local government today prioritizes its needs, 
when we ask city managers, mayors, department managers, business analysts, what determines your priorities? In most cases, the answer would be the citizens themselves. We ask people what they want through town halls or through our gut feeling or through phone surveys or through different tools. And based on what we think the citizens want the most, that's where we prioritize our needs. What are the things that our citizens, our residents care about the most? And that's true, I think, in essence, to a local government organization. If a local government manages to generate some more revenue, it doesn't give out dividends to council members, it reinvests that money in what they think citizens care about the most. And today, collecting citizen feedback is a very manual process. It's mostly done through town hall meetings, uh, which are very limited in scope, just few people, uh, maybe a few dozen people participate in each one of those. Uh, at least in Israel, there's a lot of shouting going on uh, in all different directions there. Uh, it's done by phone surveys where you call a very small sample of people. It takes you a lot of time to get those answers. And all of these tools are very limited both in scope, both in their real-time ability, and uh, uh, in the ability to recognize not only uh, get answers to questions from the city, but actually recognize emerging trends. We at Zen City um, looked at this problem and, and have been working about, on it with uh, uh, about uh, 25 cities that are already using our platform. And what we actually do is we try to look at the data that's already out there and using some AI algorithms that I'll explain in a minute, we try to recognize what are the topics that people care about the most and uh, uh, are more happy about, happy with or unhappy with. Um, so we have one question here before I, I continue. Um, the question is, does using AI and machine learning mean undergoing big data collection efforts? So that's a great question. And I think um, there's a very strong relationship between big data and machine learning. One of the best ways to deal with big data is by using machine learning because we can apply um, you know, regular statistics to uh, big data because the results will take too much time uh, to get back. So AI is a great way to deal with uh, cases where we have uh, big data sets that we need to find relationships or, or insights through them. But we can also use AI on very small data sets. Um, for example, when we started uh, doing uh, some of our, our algorithms, the basic algorithms ran on a training set of just about, about 700, 800 examples. So that's not big data on any scale. Um, and can also start to generate uh, value and insights even when training sets are small. It depends on, uh, on the specific business question you're asking. So going back to this problem of, uh, of understanding citizen needs, what we're looking at is we take data that's already out there. So social media is a great source. Today, there are 1.3 million new social media posts every minute just on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We take three-on-one data, we take emails, any types of human-generated feedback in the city, and we run um, three types of analysis on it. Uh, one is that supervised learning that I mentioned before, basic categorization. We have a model of about 86 categories. Today, our training set holds about a million examples of posts tagged into uh, garbage collection and kindergartens gardens and uh, um, uh, park maintenance and uh, uh, gun violence, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, we run a categorization algorithm on it, classic supervised learning. Then we run a sentiment analysis algorithm on it. That's also supervised learning, but uh, a little bit more uh, implicit. And then we run anomaly detection, which is actually a regression. We uh, predict what the data should look like, and if it doesn't look like uh, the way we think it, it should, then we say this is an anomaly, this is something uh, extraordinary and it's worth alerting about it. So these anomalies can be a spike in discussions about uh, public safety today, so that probably means that there is uh, a public safety event, or a decrease in discussions about uh, events, which probably means that um, the culture and events are not doing as well as usual, or a, a very small spike in discussions about traffic in a specific area, which probably means that there is uh, some unexpected traffic <laughs> happening there um, in that specific point in time. Um, so this is a little bit how our uh, dashboard looks. This uh, bar chart that you see to the left, these are all the uh, categories or departments within City Hall, um, uh, which our algorithm classifies 
data into automatically. So we can see what subjects people are talking about and the colors represent sentiment. So green is positive, red is negative and gray is neutral. Uh, we also take out keywords, do an overall uh, analysis of the sentiment um, and uh, even show the data on a map. And anybody who's interested, I'd love to share some more information about that um, afterwards if, if you'd like to learn more. So let me give you a few examples of how this was actually used and then um, I'll be happy to open uh, uh, everything up for questions. So one great example for how this classification was used uh, by one local government we're working in is trash collection. When we started working with this city, immediately we saw that the leading topic uh, with the most negative sentiment was garbage collection. A lot of complaints about garbage collection, more than any other topic in, uh, discussed in the area. And when we looked at the data, because we did this classification and on the classification, we ran a clustering algorithm that showed us within garbage collection what specifically people are talking about, we could see that almost all of the complaints are about the fact that trash bins are not being returned to their place after clearing. Yes, in Israel, that's the responsibility of the garbage collection uh, uh, people to put back the garbage can after it's collected. And all of the complaints went back to that specific problem. But the city didn't see that before because each problem was categorized to a different subject. One was missing trash can because the trash can wasn't put back in place and it got lost and it was classified as a missing trash can. One was classified as a blocked street because the trash cans rolled out to the street, blocked the way, created traffic, and that was categorized as a complaint about a, a blocked street. One was uh, classified as a broken trash can because a car that parked hit that trash can which was rolled out to the street and broke that trash can and needed replacement. So each one of those was classified within the 311 of the city to a different department or a different category. And when we ran the clustering, we saw that all these uh, complaints had the same wording of my trash can was gone, so this and that happened. And that way we could uh, imply that this was the basic challenge. And within just a couple of days, the city uh, uh, talked to the contractor clearing the garbage, made sure that they know to put uh, the garbage cans back. And within just about less than a week, uh, 311 calls in that city dropped by about 20%. Uh, discussions about uh, trash collection there became mostly positive instead of mostly negative, and we can see a material change uh, in the city just by uh, doing that. And this analysis, if it would have been done by a human, if we, we'd even thought of doing that by a human, would have taken hours and hours and hours of analyzing texts of service requests um, and, and classifying in categories. So that's one example. Another example is from the city of Paris in France that we're working with. Um, and in the city of Paris, they had uh, a bike lane that was put up in one of the main avenues. And you know, generally speaking, everybody likes bike lanes or, or should like bike lanes. And when the city said that they're about to do it, they started to see a lot of demonstrations. People were very angry about this bike lane. People were really, really, really angry. And these are real pictures collected by our, our social media collection mechanism. And the amazing thing here is that the city was super surprised. They were, you know, they knew that a lot of people in this district, it's a young, hip district, uh, are cycling and, and they thought people would be very happy with the bike lane. And they didn't understand why people were um, demonstrating against it. And when they looked at our analysis, they saw that almost all of the complaints were not about the bike lane in general, but about very two very specific things about that bike lane. One is the location of it within the street, and two, the width that was suggested for the bike lane. Those were the two things that people were complaining about. And when we showed the city that, they offered a new plan that changed where the bike lane is going to be in the street, changed its width, and immediately, uh, within I think less than a month, demonstration stopped and almost all of the objection to that bike lane disappeared completely and that went forward as a plan. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. I have a few more, but I see, I'm conscious of time and I see it, our time is running up. And I want to finish by saying that, you know, we talked here a little bit about AI and its use cases. And I think it's very, very, very important to, first of all, understand this because this is all around us. Second thing, how we can imply this technology to some of what we're doing. And in our specific case, we are using this 
in the specific context of understanding citizens' needs. And the reason we're doing that is I'm a huge Jane Jacobs fan. Um, and I think this quote that uh, we're bringing here is, is the main reasoning behind uh, what we're doing and, and why we're using AI for this specific problem. Um, and I'll finish just by, by mentioning this. So uh, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And with AI, which is in many cases an extension of our capabilities, the ability to understand things on a wide scale, to go through a lot of data, to reach conclusions faster, for the first time, maybe we can actually listen to uh, the needs of, of everybody and make sure that the city, to a greater extent, is created by everybody than what we had before. So this is um, my presentation. Um, thank you, first of all, so much for listening through it. And now I'd love to answer any questions or, or take any uh, comments or thoughts. Thanks, yeah. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna ask some questions, and I'm gonna look here as well to see if we have questions coming in. Um, the first uh, question I have is kind of who on who are the folks who you typically work with on a government team, I guess, on projects like this? Is this something that department heads are working on or is it something coming out of like a manager's or mayor's office? What does that look like? Uh, so our main clients usually are uh, city managers and mayor's offices. Um, so they're the ones leading the implementation of this uh, throughout the organization. But the specific projects can be with departments. For example, in Tel Aviv, we just had a huge project uh, with the transportation department. Um, they launched a new car sharing service, like Zipcar, but owned by the city. Um, and we just had a huge analysis of all the feedback um, around that uh, shared with them through our platform. Awesome, thanks. And my second question um, relates, I guess, kind of to scale of governments and their, be able to, their ability to engage in this work. Um, so I've worked with a lot of smaller local governments who may feel limited in their kind of capacity, whether it's financial or whether it's staff wise to, they may feel like those are potential barriers in this work. Um, has that been something you've experienced in conversations with folks of talking about how they can add value in their organization and how even if they don't have a ton of resources, this is something that could work for them? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. First of all, I, I think an exciting thing about all we're talking here is that today with existing cloud computing tools and, and existing uh, uh, you know, open source tools, this can become something which is in reach of everybody. Uh, so you don't have to have supercomputers on premise and have like data science experts on your team to implement stuff like that. There are a lot of tools that you can just buy off the shelf. And in our specific use case, um, our smallest client is a town of uh, 13,000 people in, in New Hampshire. Um, they pay us about uh, uh, less than uh, uh, $2,000 a month to get you know, a strong AI-powered platform to uh, uh, analyze the, the system feedback needs uh, across their city. So, so this is something today, more and more capabilities, uh, not just ours. You know, there are many other companies out there uh, like WayCare doing the same with uh, uh, road maintenance and, and a lot of other uh, great startups uh, doing things that you can just buy off the shelf, even if you're a smaller community with less resources. Definitely, thanks. Um, and I'm seeing, I'm looking, I'm not seeing any extra questions. Um, any last minute closing things uh, before I lead us out? Okay. All right, we're looking good. Um, so, thanks everybody for participating and sharing your time at ELGL. Um, and also, thank you, EL, for spending time with us and helping us learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence. Um, as a reminder, we've recorded today's webinar and it'll be available online soon at elgl.org. Um, you can also reference the hashtag ELGL Tech on Twitter to review and share your thoughts from today's discussion. And with that, I'll close this out. Uh, thank you for your support, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye.